Okay. Um, this will just remind me to start recording, so don't forget. Some announcements. Yeah, so quiz one is available. And again, this will only be, uh, th for this time will be full credit if you attempt it. It, it is a timed quiz. So there's five questions. Um, you have seven minutes to complete it. It's very similar to the homework questions. Uh, and this is what the quizzes will be like for the, the remaining qu quizzes as well. And it, it's only available today. So you have until midnight tonight to start and complete this uh, quiz in seven minutes. Um, homework two, I'll post that today. It'll be due next Wednesday at noon. Uh, it has uh, 20 questions. I think I might actually, I still have to edit one of the questions, but that'll be available uh, this afternoon, this evening. Uh, next week, we have a new TA in charge of quiz section. That will be Sid. And um, homework two is due next week. And again, there will be another quiz on the same day in a similar format. And then the week after that is your first midterm. So I will not be doing a quiz section, but um, during quiz section, I believe this is the case, you'll be taking your midterm. At, and we still don't know the format. It's either going to be on Canvas or through, I mean, it's definitely going to be on Canvas, but it might be similar to the quiz where you have like an hour to complete it and whatnot. You also have homework due that, that, um, that day as well. Okay, and then make sure you're on top of the reading. Like I said, the summer quarter, things are going by a bit quickly. So, you know, read ahead for next week. This is, this is the reading assignments for next week. Um, also, I've established my office hours on Monday, after class on Monday. Um, every now and then I might offer some additional office hours and I'll send an announcement out. Okay. Uh, so Dr. Brush today talked about crystals, and uh, I wanted to talk more about that. Crystallography, of course, is the study of the atomic arrangement in solids. So you have a, a crystalline solid where it has long range order, and then opposed to an amorphous solid, known as a glass material, where it still has short range order, right? So you have silicon. Silicon still tetrahedrally coordinated to oxygen, but there's no long range order in a, an amorphous solid. All right, so this is an example of quartz versus silica. In quartz and silica, they have the same uh, chemistry, the same components, silicon and oxygen, but one is crystalline, one is amorphous. And of course, as you know, silica makes up uh, gl most glass, is a major component of like window glass and other glasses, uh, like drinking glasses. Um, so here's another example of crystals. Uh, these three crystals look very similar, right? They have the same sort of uh, shape to them and uh, the, although they're different colors. So this is corundum, ruby, and sapphire. And does anyone know the atomic, excuse me, the chemical formula for these three crystals? Or one of these three crystals? Okay. The, the chemical formula for corundum, ruby, and sapphire is aluminum oxide. Let me, oops, I moved my mouse. Aluminum oxide for all three of these are made out of the same base material, which is aluminum oxide, a crystal, a crystalline aluminum oxide. Now for ruby and sapphire is interesting. To make the color, it gets doped, doping, which means we're, we're adding some kind of impurity to the crystal. And in this case for ruby, we're adding about one to three percent by weight. I think it's weight, not atomic percent. Chromium three plus and we're substituting it with aluminum inside the crystal structure. So the crystal structure is still the same, just some of the atoms have been replaced with chromium and that makes the crystal red. And sapphire, you do the same thing with titanium and iron. You have to have both in order to make it blue color. So that's a little bit of interesting. And, but the point is that they, they have the same crystal structure and that's what gives it this macroscopic shape. Um, and as Dr. Brush had mentioned, there's polycrystals. A polycrystalline material have many smaller crystals and the boundaries of these crystals are called grain boundaries, all right? So each one of these uh, crystallites has its uh, atomic arrangement, its crystal structure, but they might be in different orientations next to each other. Here's an example of a polycrystalline material. Not only is it polycrystalline, but it's a, a polycomposite material. It's a, you could consider it a composite, right? It has multiple minerals, multiple different uh, chemical formula, uh, excuse me, chemical compounds that make up this granite. So quartz, mica, feldspar. Uh, here's a, a little quiz. I, I like to give this to um, 
I do a lot of outreach for K through 12. So I'm gonna give you guys the same kind of quiz. Uh, you know, which one of these materials contains crystals? And uh, there's, there, there's one of these materials that does not contain crystals. So in the, in the chat, or you can shout it out, which one of these do you think does not contain crystals? We have crystal ware, copper metal, graphite, polyethylene. All right, it looks like most of you guys are saying uh, the polyethylene jug does not contain crystals. And that is incorrect. <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of, yeah, it's a trick question. The crystal ware is the only material on this uh, list that does not contain crystals. Crystal ware is actually glass, all right? It's just called crystal ware because, it, you know, it has facets, it's cut, and it looks like crystals. Where, you know, uh, this is something I learned, I didn't know until like high school, I took a material science camp here at the UW, that metals contain crystals. And that kind of blew my mind, that metals and everything almost is made up of crystals. Graphite, of course, has a crystal structure. We talked about that on the first week. The polymer, and this is where most people say is that it doesn't have contained crystals. Polymers do will uh, be kind of semi-crystalline where their polymer chains will arrange in a periodic fashion with long range order. And so that it, the polymers do uh, contain crystals, a uh, crystal structure. Um, crystal ware is a specific type of glass. Uh, does anyone know? No, the, the K through 12 students also all said the polymer. Some of them say the copper metal too, so it's all right. The crystal ware, does anyone know what uh, type of glass crystal ware is? Or what the, chemi what the major, uh, what, what's the chemical formula that makes crystal ware unique? And doesn't look like anyone knows. So crystal ware, Boron silicate? Uh, nope, not quite. Uh, not a, it's not a borosilicate glass, like Pyrex is a borosilicate glass. Crystal ware is a lead glass. So, you know, if you have any fine crystal in your house, it contains a bit of lead oxide. And the reason why, does anyone know why? Well, I guess you might not know because you didn't know the first question. The reason why crystal ware uses lead oxide is that the lead oxide uh, component in glass, adding lead oxide to this glass increases the index of refraction, all right, the refractive index. So it makes it so the, the light that bounces in bounces out at a higher angle. And so it makes it optically attractive, right? Like it, diamond has a very high index of refraction. Cubic zirconia has a very high index of refraction. That's why we use it as a substitute for diamond and jewelry. Crystal lead glass also has a fairly high index of refraction. The other reason why lead glass is used for crystal wear is that it makes it easy to machine. It makes it softer. It's easier to cut these facets into the glass to make it, as we call it, a crystal. But in fact, it's actually amorphous. Um, does it make it melt into molds? Yes, yeah, so, uh, but related to the manufacturability, it makes it easier to cut to make these facets. Um, and there's actually been some studies that look at, you know, different types of beverages, acidic beverages like wine and how much lead is actually leached out of the wine. So you got to be a little bit careful. Actually, my family has a bunch of crystal glass that we use almost every day. So I, I should probably check in the, how safe it actually is. Anyways, just a, and here's another example of crystals in real life. So you might have seen these guardrails or like light posts, lamp posts, uh, handrails that are zinc galvanized, right? So they're, they're made out of steel, but they're dip coated in zinc metal and uh, to act as a, a corrosion protection for the, the steel or iron. And the zinc makes these very beautiful uh, crystals and the, the shape and size of these crystals, this is called a, a spangle, right? You can have different types of spangle and depending on the different additives you put into the zinc alloy, you can make them smaller or bigger. Uh, for different optical properties, but it's mainly for uh, corrosion prevention. So next time you're at the street corner and you take a look at if uh, the lamp post is uh, zinc galvanized, you can see spot out these giant crystals. Um, so metals, uh, the element, pure elements uh, have a variety of different crystal structures. And we're gonna look at some of the more common crystal structures that Dr. Brush has already covered. Um, but 
you can see how the crystal structures follow you know these different chemical groups so obviously you know how the atoms are arranged depends on the the electron configuration uh, and and the chemistry of the, the atoms um, some so the common ones are the the uh, face centered cubic also known as cubic close packing all right so nickel copper silver gold aluminum those are the, the very common uh, face centered cubic metals um, and then bcc is another common iron at room temperature is bcc um, and the alkali metals are also bcc and then hexagonal closed pack is also the common uh, element or crystal structure we talk about titanium specifically is uh, when when I think of HCP I always think of titanium metal. Um, yes, some some of the crystal structures will change at different temperatures. Uh, iron is is the the obvious example of that at a higher temperature. I, I forget which what temp is like seven hundred and something degrees Celsius, seven twenty four or something like that. It changes from BCC into FCC, and then at an even higher temperature, it changes back to BCC. Another interesting thing about the crystal structure of iron is um, when we start talking about alloys, so we're substituting some of the iron atoms for some other atoms, uh, specifically stainless steel is made of a nickel iron alloy. There's a large percentage of nickel. So if you put a large percentage of nickel substitute with the iron, what happens is your, your crystal structure changes. Uh, the crystal structure of stainless steel is uh, FCC, not BCC. All right, let's uh, move on. Uh, so this, we're coming to our first uh, question, first problem uh, is unit cell calculations. I, I'm gonna have you guys uh, uh, do uh, these number of problems for each unit cell. The first is the number of atoms in the unit cell. So in this example is just the simple cubic lattice. And as Dr. Brush had said, polonium is the only single element that forms a simple cubic lattice. All right, the crystal structure is simple cubic, and we'll talk about this a bit more. The crystal structure is made up of a lattice points and a basis, in this case, it's just a single atom. All right, and so the number of atoms in each unit cell you need to calculate for simple cubic is rather easy. Each corner, there's eight corners, and each corner has one eighth of an atom, so there's one atom per unit cell. Okay, and then you want to find out the coordination number. So this is the number of nearest neighbors. Uh, for a, any, any atom, they're all, they're all, they're non-unique, right? They're all the same. So if you take one atom here and find its nearest neighbors, and you say, so you have to kind of imagine what does the unit cell above and to the right and in front of it look like. So if we take this corner atom, there's these three here, one, two, three, and there's also going to be three, uh, there's one above, one to the right, and one in front. So the coordination number is six, which makes an octahedral coordination. Okay, then lattice parameter A, so that's the dimension of the unit cell, okay, and in terms of radius. So a simple cubic is very easy. Uh, it's just the, the two radii, so A equals two R. And then also the atomic packing factor, uh, it's gonna be the volume of atoms, so four thirds pi R cubed, times the number of atoms in the unit cell, divided by the volume of the unit cell. So it'll be, in this case, uh, A cubed, which is 2R cubed, okay? So a simple cubic is not very dense. It's a 50% uh, atomic packing factor. All right, and I wanted to do this. Uh, we're gonna do it for body center cubic and face center cubic, but not hexagonal. It's a little bit more difficult. Um, I wanted to do this, uh, break you guys into breakout rooms. Um, I haven't really prepared it. And then I'll give you about five or so minutes to do it. We're going to start with the face center cubic. And then I, after five or so minutes, I'll, I'll call out on a, room, uh, a group for the answer. But uh, So when I break you out into breakout rooms, you're, I think you're going to lose this page. So I, what I suggest you doing is if you're on your computer, uh, if you open up like PowerPoint or Word, you can quickly copy this, uh, this slide. If you're on Windows, the shortcut for a screenshot is just uh, Windows Shift S, and then it'll allow you to make a screenshot. I don't know if you can see what I see because my screen, get, my screen gets frozen. And then when you select the area you want to screenshot, uh, it copies it to the clipboard. So for example, I like to do everything in PowerPoint. 
So yeah, there it is. So that way you have it when I break you out in the breakout room. So I'll go back here real quick. Um, so this is gonna be a, a little bit of an experiment for me because I haven't really done this before. Let's see, we're gonna have, let's try to get four participants per room about three to four participants per room. All right, looks like everyone's back now. Uh, so we're gonna go over the answers. I'm gonna pick on uh, people from different groups to give their answer. Now, if you don't have an answer, that's okay. Just say you didn't come up with an answer or whatever excuse you wanna come up with, but it, it's totally fine. Um, so let's start with uh, from, let's see, room one. If you're there, can you answer the first question? How many atoms fit in the in one FCC unit cells? Count the number of nearest neighbors or neighbors that are touching. So below it, directly below it, we should have four, right? We have one and two, we can see two here, but there's also two in the back that we can't see. Then along the equator here, we have these four that we can see here. And then directly above it, there's gonna be another four. All right, so four times three is 12. And this makes this uh, symmetry called a cubo-octahedron, all right? So if you have your central atom and then this is the, the nearest neighbors around it, makes 12 nearest neighbors. All right, um, how about the next question, last parameter, A in terms of uh, radius R. So in this diagram I drew here is just of the face of the FCC unit cell. And we're looking for A in terms of R, the radius of the atom. So here we can draw the shape, we have a triangle um, where the, what is this, the hypotenuse, man, it's been a long time since trigonometry, is equal to 4R, all right? And then the legs of the triangle are A, and we can use, um, what is that, Pythagorean's theorem, A squared plus A, B squared equals C squared, and then you can solve for A in terms of R. So A equals 2R times the square root of 2. So if you know the radius of any atom, okay, you can calculate, and you know it's FCC, crystal structure, then you can calculate its, its uh, lattice parameter A. Okay, and then from that, you can use it to calculate the density of the material, if you know its molar mass. 0.74 is correct, yeah. So you just take uh, the volume of the atoms in the unit cell, so we have four atoms times the volume of a sphere divided by the volume of the unit cell, and if you've You've calculated the parameter, last parameter, just a squared, or cubed, excuse me, a cubed. Uh, so it's that value cubed, 0.74. So that's an important number to, to memorize, 0.74. For FCC, 0.74. Also 12 is an important number, and four. So these, those are the important numbers. Okay, let's move on. Um, and we're kind of, <laughs> it takes a little bit of time to go through all this. So I think uh, if it's okay with you guys, we're gonna just, not break out into breakout rooms for this next one so I can move on to the, the next content. Um, but the same thing for BCC. So I'll go through it with you or we can just uh, answer out loud. Uh, so how many atoms fit in one, oh, I, this is a typo here, it should say one BCC unit cell. How many atoms are inside one BCC unit cell? Anyone wanna shout out? Or, I think that should be two. Uh, yes, that is two. How about the coordination number? Eight. Eight is correct, right? So it's uh, just take this one atom in the center and it's got eight corners surrounding it. So it, it makes a cubic geometry. Um, how about the lattice parameter? This one's a bit more time consuming, so I'll just go through it. So here I've drawn a shape, I've drawn a plane that cuts from edge to edge right down the center of this cube, okay? And I've drawn out the two, the two dimensional projection of that plane of the atoms. And you'll see that there's a uh, continuous uh, three atoms down the center here. And so that's equal to four R, four times the radius. And then the edge is the last parameter A. So that's what we're looking for in terms of R. And then I've also drawn this triangle, which is the base of the square. And so I've kind of unfolded it out into this two dimensional projection, kind of like origami here. And it has two last parameters as well, these two edges here. So again, through Pythagorean's theorem, a squared plus a squared equals c squared, a squared, b squared equals c squared. So that makes this edge length here along the, the diagonal 
a times the square root of two. So now we have our, our, our two legs, a and b, and that equals c. So you again, Pythagorean's theorem, and um, you get a in terms of r. So a equals 4r over the square root of three. Um, how about atomic packing factor? Does anyone know the answer on the top of their head? Yeah, 0 0.68, Greece says. That's correct, 0 0.68. So it's the same calculation. You have the information you need. But uh, like I said, for, for cubic, for FCC and BCC and HCP, you should memorize these numbers because they might come up in a test or something and you don't have to calculate it. Yeah, two atoms per unit cell, eight nearest neighbors, the coordination, and 0 0.68, 68%. Um, hexagonal closed pack, uh, not gonna do any calculations really, but it's just to visualize uh, how the atoms are packed, right? Um, so here's, a, again, a two-dimensional projection of just this first layer here, and then I move up to this, the layer above it, okay? So this is that J atom here on the layer above it, and then the next layer on top of that, okay? So you get uh, the parameter, last parameter A is just two R, and uh, there's two atoms per this unit cell in the smaller unit cell, but the expanded unit cell, this hexagonal unit cell, there's six atoms. Um, but what's, what is important, it, like Dr. Brush had mentioned in class, is the similarity between HCP and FCC. Um, they are both closed packed lattices, and they, they both have the same atomic packing factor, right? Uh, which was 0 0.74. Did I get that one right? I always forget. I haven't memorized it myself. Yeah, 0 0.74. Just double checking. All right, so they have the same uh, packing factor. And like Dr. Brush had mentioned, it, the only difference is the, you know, they have these closed packed planes of atoms and the layering uh, sequence is different where HCP is ABA and FCC is ABC. And I've tried to visualize this at, uh, further for the FCC, so you can try to see where the cubic structure comes from in this uh, orientation, right? So you can see where this is the FCC cube. I've taken just this face and this, the uh, two-dimensional projection of that face, and there's the face-centered face of it, okay? Um, and then the coordination is the same for both of them, but what is different is the, the symmetry of that, the, the geometry. All right, so for HCP, which is ABA, it has this, this weird shape, triangular ortho by cupola. You don't need to know the names of anything, but you do need to know that the coordination is 12. And so this is that visualization of the 12. Um, and then FCC, because it's ABC, it has a different geometry, cubooctahedron. And this is important, and I, I think the mechanical engineers in the group will, will find this interesting. Um, you know, even though they have the same coordination, the same atomic packing factor, but because the difference in the stacking between HCP and FCC, their mechanical properties are much different in general. For metals that are FCC crystal structure, that's aluminum, copper, nickel, gold, they are very malleable metals. But metals that are HCP, primarily titanium, are not very malleable. Okay, and that's because of the crystal structure, the arrangement of these layers. Uh, to make a metal malleable means we're, we're, we're plastically deforming the material. It means we're, we're physically having the atoms slide past each other when we pull a metal apart, all right? And so uh, the question is, how easy is it for atoms to slide past each other between these two different uh, crystal structures? And it depends on the number of directions that the plane that we're talking about, a plane of atom, like an A plane, B plane, that can slide, okay? So I, I try to visualize this. This is a little bit beyond the scope of the class, although I think we might talk a little bit more about it when we discuss mechanical properties, but at this point, you don't really need to know. But so I've drawn out a plane of atoms, all right? Uh, this is a closed packed plane. For FCC and HCP, they both have these same closed packed planes, but the FCC has, uh, more than one uh, of the same closed packed plane. So I'm gonna draw another one here. Here's another plane of closed packed atoms. Okay, the same shape, the same uh, uh, arrangement of atoms, where HCP does not have that arrangement. You can't make another one of these hexagons in this 
uh, geometry. Okay, and then actually FCC has two more. So it has a total of four closed plaque planes. Okay, and so uh, later on you'll talk about slip systems. This is, these are the systems of, of how atoms can slide past each other. All right, and so FCC has many more slip systems than HCP does. HCP only has three slip systems. FCC has 12. That's why FCC metals are in general are more malleable than HCP, okay? All right, um, let's move on. Uh, so yeah, the equations to know, APF, atomic packer factor, the volume of the atoms divided by the unit cell. Uh, this will also come up, uh, the density, I think you've already probably seen it in last homework, is uh, of course mass over volume, but when you're calculating using the atoms and the, the crystal structure, you can use this equation here. N is the number of atoms in the unit cell. A is the molar mass of the atom, or atomic mass of the atom. Um, N is Avogadro's number. VC is the volume of the unit cell. Okay, so as long as you know those uh, parameters, like the A and uh, R, uh, then you, you should be able to calculate density if you're given a, a molar mass. And you should also know the number of atoms in the molar uh, unit cell. Um, N is the number of atoms in the unit cell. So we, we calculated that for FCC, it was four atoms, BCC, it was two atoms, and so on. A is the molar mass. So it's going to be in uh, grams per mole, okay? Uh, N sub A is just Avogadro's number. What was that? 6.022 times 10 to 23. Um, what is that? Atoms per molecule, or just atoms, right? Uh, per mole, atoms per mole, excuse me. So then that will cancel out the moles and you're left with grams um, per atom times the number of atoms divided by VC is the volume of the unit cell. So you're left with, you know, the mass of the atoms in the unit cell divided by the volume of the unit cell. And that's density. Okay, so we're going to move on and talk about uh, some symmetry of crystal structures. And uh, Dr. Brush had briefly mentioned this, the Brave lattices. So like he said, all crystals can be arranged or uh, categorized into one of these 14 Brave lattices, okay? Um, and so the ones that we typically deal with is, are the cubic system because the symmetry is, is easy. Mathematically, it's easy to work with. Um, but again, there's different uh, lattice types. Um, and these are just lattices, okay? These are not crystal structures. Lattices are just a set of points in space. It doesn't, doesn't mean where the, I mean, atoms can be put onto these lattice points or a group of atoms can be put onto these lattice points. Um, and then there's a bit of complexity, you know, especially in the hexagon. So I just screen clipped this from Wikipedia. If you look up a like, crystal structure or something. Uh, you know, between hexagonal, the uh, crystal family system and the lattice system and, and trigonal, hexagonal. It's not, you know, you don't need to know, it's not too important, but um, we'll talk a little bit when we start looking at he uh, hexagonal closed packed and which uh, system it's in. But we're, what this is showing is the Brave lattice and it's just a way to categorize the symmetries of these crystals. Um, in a graduate level courses, we talk about space group symmetries, which are just further ways of defining uh, the symmetry of the, the different crystals and so on. Um, and so what I want to emphasize, and a lot of students miss this, and even I've, I've even had some professors that have, have incorrectly said this, um, but I want to emphasize that the crystal structure is made up of the lattice plus a basis. And some of this oftentimes this is also called the motif. So I'll, I use these interchangeably, motif and basis. So the lattice, like I said, is just a group of points in space. It doesn't represent uh, you know, the crystal structure it, physically. It's just a group of points. So FCC is a lattice. It's a Brave lattice. And for example, gold, the metal, has the FCC crystal structure. So in this case, the lattice and crystal structure have the same name. Okay, but it's not the same, it's not necessary for other crystals. Uh, here's another example, BCC of iron has a BCC crystal structure. And then uh, uh, um, inert gases, this is methane and other noble gases, if you cool it down to solidify them, generally 
form in the FCC crystal structure. So in this case, the basis is a group of atoms. It's a, it's a molecule. And if you cool it down enough, it forms the FCC crystal structure. Uh, but then it can get more complex. So here's an example. Um, this is the cesium chloride crystal structure. So what do you think the base, or excuse me, what do you think the lattice is of this crystal structure? What is the, the lattice? And specifically, what, what is the Bravais lattice, right? So it's, it's gonna be one of these cubic. Saying BCC because it's incorrect. And this is the point I'm trying to make. The lattice in, for this crystal structure is not BCC. Um, it's actually simple cubic, okay? So I have drawn this out. The motif is cesium chloride. It's a group of two atoms, okay? So that's the motif there. There's the simple cubic lattice points, okay? So if you were to take this motif, you know, let's take this chlorine ion with the, uh, the cesium attached, you, move, you translate it to each one of these lattice points that's how you expand to this cesium chloride crystal structure. So the crystal structure is not BCC. That's what I, I've heard. I've heard some professors say, oh, this is BCC. No, it's not BCC. BCC would be if, if the atom in the center is the same as the atoms at these lattice points. But the atom in the center is not the same, okay? The lattice structure is simple cubic. The, the Bravais lattice is simple cubic. It has a motif of two atoms. So if you translate this motif to all of these different lattice points, that's how you build up the crystal. And the crystal structure is called cesium chloride. It's uh, the other, uh, uh, like cesium bromide, cesium iodide, I think they all make the cesium chloride crystal structure. So does that make sense? Why does the central atom not count? So in BCC, I should have included this. I had a picture of what it would look like if it was BCC. In BCC, all the atoms are the same, okay? Like uh, iron is BCC, okay? But in this case, this, the atom in the center is not the same as the atom on the corner. Yeah, it's simple cubic of cesium chloride, like of the cesium chloride molecule, I guess you could say. All right, so this is what I wanted to emphasize, <laughs> that this is not the BCC structure. And I have some more examples that should make it clear. Um, so here are a, a set of different crystal structures and their, their respective names. So sodium chloride is called the rock salt crystal structure. Uh, it's also called the halite crystal structure, it's the same thing. So what is the lattice what is the Brave lattice for sodium chloride? What do you guys think? All right, it's, it's not BCC this time. This time it's FCC, yeah. And the motif, what do you think the motif is for FCC? And you can see it here, you know, just look at these uh, blue atoms, right? Blue, which, uh, which atom is the blue atom? It is uh, smaller, so it's gonna be the cation. Typically cations are smaller, right? We're giving away ele electrons. So. Um, so you see the sodium makes this FCC lattice here. So what is the basis? Yeah, so sodium chloride is right, two atoms. So sodium chloride is the basis. So if you took this sodium attached to this chlorine, uh, even if you just put, took the middle or the center of mass and you put it at each one of these lattice points, you're gonna construct the sodium chloride crystal structure. Okay, how about calcium fluoride or fluorite crystal structure? What's the lattice? Yeah, this one's also FCC. Um, and how about the basis for this one? Yeah, so this one was, you see, you know, the, here's the FCC lattice right here. The, what is this? The calcium makes that FCC structure.
All right, I'm gonna move on. The motif for this is just uh, a group of three atoms, calcium and two fluorines. So if you were to take calcium and two fluorines and translated it to every lattice point in the FCC, you're gonna make the fluorite structure, right? So if you took, say, these three atoms right here, calcium and two fluorines, you translate this over to the next one, you're gonna, you're gonna get, you're gonna build up the, the symmetry, right? Okay. And there, and there shouldn't be any overlapping. When you translate it, there's no like duplicates. That wouldn't work. It, they're all unique. Okay, now we get to titanium, the HCP. Yeah, so I wanna emphasize this as well because a lot of students get this incorrect. HCP is a crystal structure. It is not a Brave lattice, okay? If, we go, if you go back to the Brave lattices, you know, I, and this will give away the next answer, you know, hexagonal, does not have any, uh, doesn't have face center, doesn't have body center, all right? There's only simple hexagonal is the only Brave lattice for hexagonal. So the crystal structure is HCP. What is the lattice? I already gave away, it's hexagonal. The motif is actually uh, two titanium atoms, okay? So that's the point I wanna make that lattice points and crystal structure are different, okay? They're not the same. Lattice is just a set of points in space and depends on what you put onto those points in space. And that can build up, and that's how we get so many different types of crystal structures, not just 14. There's way more than 14 crystal structures, there's, but there's only 14 Brave lattices. Okay. Yeah, simple hexagonal. Let's move on. Uh, so here's a question. Um, and I, 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 don't, I, I don't remember if Brush got to this in his lecture, but it's definitely part of the reading, I believe. Now, here's an example of a ionic, solid, magnesium oxide. So magnesium is a cation two plus, oxygen is an anion two minus. It, the ionic solid, so it, oxygen arranges itself into an FCC anion lattice. So here are the lattice points for the oxygen. So you, you can assume that oxygen is gonna be on each one of these points, okay? Uh, the question is, where will the magnesium go? And this deals with what we call interstitials interstitials are the spaces in between. Uh, so in FCC, there are two different types of interstitials. There is this red one here is the octahedral interstitial, interstitial, right? That's made up from the faces. And then on the corners is the tetrahedral interstitial. So for each unit cell, well, there should be eight, there should be eight uh, octahedral, excuse me, there should be eight tetrahedral uh, interstitial sites. And I believe there's also, let's see, there's one on each face, seven. Uh, no, it's each edge. So there's what? One, two, three, four. That's eight. There's 12. Uh, 13. And anyway, oh, yeah, I forgot to divide by two. Anyways, the question is uh, where will magnesium go? Will magnesium go into the octahedral sites or will it go into the tetrahedral sites? Does anyone know how to? go about solving the problem? Uh, what do we have to look at? And it, I, I believe this was part of the reading for this week. Yeah, the radii. So we look at the atomic radii and what do we look about? You know, what, what, do, we, what do we need to do? Make sure they don't overlap. Um, I think there's a, it's a more general rule to determine whether it's octahedrally coordinated or tetrahedrally coordinated. So I'll, I'll, I'll go into that. So this is from Callister. Um, it might be chapter 14 actually, which is part of your reading assignment. Um, and you, what you do is take the ratio of the cation to the anion radius, okay? And it's a general rule of thumb, if they fall in one of these ranges, that will be the coordination of the, anion, or the cation to the anion. And remember, right, usually the, the cation is the smaller anion, excuse me, I'm getting my words messed up. Cation is usually the smaller ion because you're giving away electrons, your electron shell is getting smaller. The anion is usually the bigger ion because it's receiving electrons and it's, it's uh, less, it's more loosely bounded to the, the atom. Um, and so in this case, you just take the ratio between the two, okay? And so the ratio between magnesium and oxygen, 0.51. So that falls into here, coordination number six, which is an octahedral. 
All right, so magnesium is going to fit into the octahedrals, not into the tetrahedrals. It's, it's more energetically favorable, and that's why these, these numbers are determined. It's, it's which coordination makes it more energetically favorable. If you have a, a too small of an atom inside the octahedral, it's not very energetically stable. You can think of like a, a small atom rattling around in a cage. It, it'd rather be too big than, it, than too small. Um, so this is what that looks like if we take the magnesium, put it at each of these edges and inside the center. And then if we expand this octahedral, this is the next door neighbor octahedral um, interstitial site. And I think there was another question I had. Yeah, what's the crystal structure of magnesium oxide? What do you guys think? And you should be able to just look at this and know right away what the crystal structure is. And it's one of the crystals that we already talked about. What is the crystal structure? And what I'm looking for is the name of the crystal structure, right? Uh, so not BCC. BCC is only a crystal structure if the entire material is the same uh, composition, like, uh, like iron. It's all made of iron. That can, that's the only time BCC can be a crystal structure. Otherwise, it's a lattice. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, you're right. Halite is correct. Uh, sodium chloride. Uh, crystal structure or rock salt. This is the halite rock salt or sodium chloride crystal structure. All right, it's the same as what we saw before. I won't go all the way back. Okay, uh, let's go into Miller indices, okay, and crystallographic directions. So, you know, if we want to describe uh, the range or the, the plane of atoms inside a unit cell, or perhaps what the atoms look like at the surface of different single crystals, uh, we use what's called Miller indices. All right, here's an example of the spinel crystal structure. This is iron, uh, what we call, this is iron 304. It's also iron 23 oxide because it has a mix of iron 2 plus and iron 3 plus. It's called magnetite. It makes the spinel crystal structure and you, these nanoparticles of that spinel and um, macro particles, crystals, having the same shape. And the shape is determined, of course, by the crystal structure. But the question is, you know, how do you, how can you um, describe the surface of these crystals? And we use Miller indices. Miller indices have this abbreviation HKL, and these are integer values. So here's another example of some kind of nanocrystal, I forget, but it describes the different surfaces of this crystal with the Miller indices. And then there's also, you should just distinguish it from the direction. Uh, where are the crystal structures such as halite found? Um, I, don't, I quite, don't quite understand the question, where are crystal structures such as halite found? You mean like on Earth? Oh, the, like a list of crystal structures. Um, I, I am pretty sure chapter three, if not chapter three, it's chapter 14, I believe, was part of the reading. There's a small reading assignment in chapter 14. I think that talks about ceramic crystals. 14 or 12? Oh, did I mix that up? It might be 12 then. If I'm, I don't have it right in front of me, so I, I'm not sure. Okay. It might be 12, not 14. Uh, the chapter is about uh, ceramic crystals or ionic crystals, I believe, and it, it should give you a different list of crystal structures. Um, and then the direction uh, are just vectors, but you need to make sure that you're using the correct notation. If you're talking about a plane, in space uh, for Miller indices, it's using parentheses or sometimes these curly brackets. We're talking about a family of planes. Um, and if it's a direction, you use the square brackets or these uh, little, what do you call those? I don't know if they, carrots, arrows, whatever, for a family of directions. So I have a couple of problems, but I think we'll just go through them because we don't have much time. And like I said, don't feel obligated to stay. I This recording will be posted uh, this evening once it it finishes compiling. Uh, so for crystallographic directions, all right, using the square brackets, uh, is, is very simple, just vector math, right? So you take the, the final coordinate point in, in real space and minus the initial coordinate point. Um, or excuse me, this should be lattice space. Because this, this uh, you know, here I sh show x, y, and z and to think of three dimensions. But that's only correct if your unit cell is orthogonal, okay, if it has uh, these right angles. But you, as you know, some unit cells don't have right angles at the origin. So it's not really correct to say X, Y, and Z, uh, but we're talking about lattice space. 
the, the vector math will still be the same. So you should use these uh, unit vectors instead of x, y, and z. Uh, but in these examples, they're all cubic, so it's, it's all the same. But like in this example, you know, just doing the vector math, finding the end, end coordinate, the beginning coordinate, and that will give you, and you should multiply the fractions out. So in this example, the end coordinate is one and then three quarters zero, because there's no, there's no change in the z dimension. Um, initial is the origin. So what you need to do is multiply by four to remove fractions, okay? So there, there's no fractions in the, the Miller notation for directions or for planes. Uh, so this direction will be called brackets four, three, zero. Okay, I had some questions I was gonna have you guys do yourself, and, but because there's not enough time, and I, I'm pretty sure your homework deals with questions like this as well. Um, but here's, I'll just go through this. So this direction to point A, all right, the coordinates are one half, one half, one half, all right, and it starts at the origin. So then if we multiply out the fractions, so we multiply everything by two, this is just gonna be one, 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 all right, in brackets, one, one, one. This is the one, one, one direction. This one is not starting at the origin, okay? So you have to kind of do the math here. Uh, so we start, and you can always move this to the origin to make it easier, and that's what I'll try to visualize. So in the x direction, we're moving over one third. We're going from two thirds to one, okay? And then in the z direct, uh, y direction, we're moving one, and in the z direction, we're moving negative one. Uh, for negatives in Miller notation, negatives are written with a bar over the number, okay? So we need to multiply out the fractions. So this was uh, what I say, one third for the x direction. So we're going to multiply everything by three. So it's going to be turned into three and then it's one in the y direction and then one, excuse me, I'm sorry, I messed that up. It's going to be one, three, three bar. Okay, one, three, three bar. Okay, three bar means negative. And then the last one, we're going from this corner here, we're moving uh, positive one in the x direction, negative one half in the y direction, and negative one in the z direction. Okay, we move, remove the fractions, so we're gonna multiply everything by two. So it's gonna be two, one bar, one bar. Let's see. Oh, excuse me, did I do that wrong? Two, one bar, two bar. Yeah, I forgot. Okay, uh, now for Miller indices, talking about planes, it's a bit more complex. It's not as simple. There's a, uh, we need to change it into what we call reciprocal space, um, but it's still not too complicated. And a lot of your homework will be, uh, will have some of these problems. In fact, this might even be a problem from your homework. Let's start with uh, B, for example. So we wanna find out what the Miller indices of plane B is. Uh, B is easier than A, so we'll start with B. So what you need to do is from the origin, find the intercepts of this plane with the different axes. All right, so this B plane intercepts X axis at one half, okay? It intercepts the Y axis at one half and it intercepts the Z axis at one, okay? And then the next step is to take the reciprocal. So that's what this, this is how it's different than the regular vector notation. We're gonna take the reciprocal of this, these intercepts, so it becomes two, two, one. Reciprocal of one is one. And then uh, if there's any fractions, you, you multiply them out. And then the final notation is two, two, one for this plane. That's how we describe this plane. Uh, for, for A, it's a bit more complex because A intersects our origin. So we need to move our origin. We can't have it intersect the origin. We need to move the origin in order to calculate it. So if we move the origin to this position here, so we consider this zero, zero, zero. Oops. Oh, sorry. In the X axis intercepts at two thirds. The Y axis, now we're going to negative, intersects at one. And the Z axis intercepts at one half. Uh, let me see, there's a question. How do we know when to write two, two, one that we mean the plane and not the vector? Oh yeah, so the vector is always gonna be, this is the square brackets. Whenever you see a square bracket, you, you know it's a vector, a, a direction. But when it's a plane, we use the, the parentheses. So that's how you know. 
Um, so moving, so going back, let's see, where was I? The, the, Z, the Y direction is negative one and the Z direction is one half right here. Is the, excuse me, the Z intercept is one half. Then take the reciprocal, so two thirds becomes three halves. Negative one is still negative one. One half becomes two. And then you need to multiply out the refractions. So multiply everything out by two. So this becomes three, two bar, four. So that is the Miller indice for this plane A. Uh, there's another question I missed. How do you know the right order of the numbers? Um, are we talking about, Daniel, this was your question, the right order of the numbers. Are we talking about the directions here? So it's, it's always going to be like X, Y, Z oh, for the planes, the right order. Um, it's again, the, when we're talking about intercepts, it'll be X, Y, Z is always in that order. And like I said, X, Y, Z is a bit misleading, especially if we, if we're changing into a, this is supposed to be lattice space and not real space. But for cubic, the lattice space is the same as real space. But if, you're, if your unit cell you know, is like trigonal or monoclinic, it's gonna have different angles. The, the procedure is all the same. Yeah. Um, so here's some uh, problems that we'll go over. I think there was a typo here. This one half is by itself, it shouldn't be there. Uh, so this, we're gonna find the Miller indices of these different planes of the cubic uh, unit cell. So this one here is a bit different because uh, we don't have, uh, it doesn't intersect, right? Uh, in fact, um, it, you could expand this plane and intersect way up here. Uh, but instead, what we'll do is we'll move the origin. We're going to move the origin to this top corner here. And so in the x direction, it's negative one. In the y direction, it's negative one and the z direction is negative one. So this, this Miller indice of this is gonna be one bar, one bar, one bar. Let's see, yeah, that's right. Okay, and this plane is equivalent to uh, one, 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 all right? One bar, one bar, one bar is equivalent to one, one, one. Uh, it's also equivalent to two, 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 and so on, all right? Uh, but so one, this, you know, the correct answer would be one bar, one bar, one bar. Uh, the next one, let's see. So this problem is a bit different than the other ones because the, it never intersects the y-axis, all right? This plane never intersects the y-axis. Uh, so that in that case, for y, it'll be zero. Let's start with x, though. x is going to be one, y is zero because it never intersects y, and then uh, Z is one half. So remember, we need to take the reciprocal. So we start one, zero, one half, take the reciprocal is one, zero, two, and then there's no fraction. So that should be the answer. One, zero, two is the Miller indice for this plane. This next one is a bit more difficult because again, the, the intersection with the X axis is not in the view of this unit cell. Uh, so you would have to extrapolate this plane down. So if this is one half here, if, and this is one to one half, and then continue down, then it's going to end up intersecting x at uh, two. So x is two, y is one, and z is one. And this was starting at the origin again. Okay. So it's two one one. Oh, I got that wrong. What did I have? Oh, I forgot to take the reciprocal. Yeah, yeah. So it's two one one before the reciprocal. But remember, we need to take the reciprocal. Reciprocal. So two turns into one half. So then it's one half, one one. Then multiply out the fractions. It becomes two one one. Excuse me. One two two. Okay. So I got that one wrong because I forgot to do the reciprocal. So always remember for planes, you need to take the reciprocal. Uh, before the final uh, answer. Okay, um, and then here's another question. Find the 111 plane of this unit cell, this FCC unit cell, and then also draw the 2D atomic arrangement of that 111 plane. Now, there's a question on your homework that's very similar to this, and I, I wanna, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, the homework said it was a hard, a difficult question, but it could be very easy if you know this trick, if you know this, I guess. Uh, so 111, of course, 
the x-intercept is one here, the y is one here, and z is one here. So that makes this triangular plane, okay? And then if we were looking at the atoms that intersect this plane and to draw out those atoms, you know, you get the closed pack structure, the closed pack uh, plane. Uh, so for FCC unit cells, 111 is the closed packed plane of atoms. Whenever you see this hexagonal symmetry, right, this hexagonal symmetry of atoms like this, this closed packed plane, you should know right away that it's either, it's either the 100 plane of HCP, 100 of HCP, or a 111 plane of FCC. All right, so there's a question on your homework that is, might seem at first a bit difficult because it wants you like to calculate something in order to find it. It gives you like an image of this and you should know right away when you see this, oh, that's the 111 plane of FCC or the 100 plane of HCP. But the question made it obvious is F FCC. <clears throat> okay, um, the same thing for BCC, find the 110 plane and then draw the atomic arrangement of that. Um, and so this one, 110, the intercept on the x-axis, one here, and the intercept on the y-axis is one here, and there's no intersect on the zero, on z. So it's just going to be a uh, slice along the diagonal here, okay, is the 110 plane. And if we were to draw out the atoms on this plane, this is what it look, looks like. And remember, we talked previously what the unit cell uh, lattice parameters were. And uh, so this is the atomic arrangement of the 110 plane for BCC. So if you had a uh, iron, for example, iron is a BCC metal. If you had a single crystal of iron, for example, if you had a single crystal of iron and it was cut along this 110 plane so that the surface of the single crystal one was 110. At the surface, the atoms would be arranged in this uh, pattern. All right, so that's uh, what that means there. Okay, um, I think next I'm going to talk about uh, X ray diffraction, but we've gone a bit over time. And Dr. Brush has not yet talked about X-ray diffraction yet. Uh, so I think I'm going to end it here and leave that for Dr. Brush and Sid to talk about next time. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording. And if you guys have any last questions, you can go ahead and ask. And we can go back if you need to, because I did go through it a bit quickly. <clears throat>